Welcome to Welcome the Shepherd's to the Chapel, Chapel Network, Network Family, Family Bible, Bible Study, Study Hour with Pastor, with Pastor Arnold, Murray. Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word, chapter 24, the great book of Proverbs. The book of comparisons. In other words, God comparing that that is good with that that is bad, and it's your choice. You deal the hand, and it's all yours, and away you go. So uh, everybody must be responsible for their own actions. And this gives you a head start by gaining wisdom from your Father's Word as how to be blessed. So having said that, chapter 24, verse 1, let's go with that word of wisdom from our Father. Verse 1 reads, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. I mean, this, this has to do, this particular chapter as well as the last couple, with personal character. And... Um, don't don't um, envy what wicked men have. They're not going to have it long. They'll lose it, and um, some other evil person will rip them off, or they'll be arrested and lose it in fines. And most of all, they lose it because they don't have God's blessings. You do when you follow Him. That makes all the difference. Verse two: For their heart studieth destruction. They they dream about it. And their lips talk of mischief. They, they plan it. They live for it. And um, so how, how could you envy someone that uh, was of that nature? You don't even want a friend like that. Verse 3. Through wisdom is an house builded, and by understanding it is established. You might say, by wisdom is an house build it. In other words, if you utilize wisdom, uh, you can build that house, but understanding establishes it. It helps you keep peace in your family. It helps you to have a family, to have God's blessings, whereby it is blessed. And um, that's what wisdom does for you. Lack of wisdom, lack of anything. Verse 4. And by knowledge uh, shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. In other words, it'll be filled with goods that are necessary and uh, to the operation of your family, business, farm, ranch, whatever the case may be. God knows what your needs are and He blesses you when you bless Him, when you study His Word knowing that wisdom comes from Him. And he likes to see his children, those that love him, do well. That's why he blesses them. Verse 5, a wise man is strong. Yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. Uh, I, I, I like to translate this, a wise man gains power. Okay, And, um, and with knowledge, it even increases that power, whereby he has control of his home, of his family, that is to say, I'm speaking financially and otherwise, that he has the power to maintain that, to, to um, uh, have it blessed, and to prosper. And not only that, your community is important. And there are times in life that you have to do community service, that is to say, uh, see that um, Maybe it's just a vote or something of that nature to have good city officials, community officials. You take an interest in what is around you, not only for your sake, but for your children's sake and your neighbor's sake. Okay? Uh, that is power, is God's blessings. Verse 6, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in multitude of counselors there is safety. Now, and uh, this multitude of counselors must be wise counselors, though. You, you don't want to have a, a, a multitude of knuckleheads and listen to what a, what a bunch of um, unwise people might have to say. 
You certainly, uh, especially in making war, you want experience. You want somebody that's been there, somebody that's tasted of fire, and, and know and understand what it's all about. And uh, that's wisdom. Otherwise, it's hot air. In your choice, God gives you a comparison. And when Jesus himself would teach, if, if you're going to make war, you send someone out, an ambassador or a spy, and find out how many there are and whether you can cut it or not, okay? And if not, you better get God to cut it for you. Verse 7, wisdom is too high for a fool. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. In other words, um, when it comes to wisdom, a fool, he'll just say, I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't know. And the gate is where you place someone that's a judge. And what it's saying here, you sure don't want him opening his mouth in the, in the uh, capacity of a judge because he can't even judge his own life, much less somebody else's. Okay. Um, yeah, deliberate, deliberation and judgment, that's where the seat is. You don't want him anywhere near it unless he's being judged by a, a wise counselor. Wisdom is a beautiful thing. Where does it come from? It comes from our Heavenly Father. It is precious. With his wisdom, you can gain all things. You can gain power. Okay. Verse 8. He that deviseth to do evil um, shall be called a mischievous person. That's to say he, um, he, he absolutely plans it, plots it. That's all he does is plots mischief, plots evilness. That's a person you sure don't want around, okay? Verse 9. The thought of foolishness is sin. Even to think about it, okay? And the scorner is an abomination to men. A scorner is one that mocks God, doubts God, and would even go as far as an atheist might, saying there is no God. Our Father finds that to be an abomination and they will be treated accordingly. They will never have peace of mind. Okay. Always the big question. Verse 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. In other words, um, you, you never want to let them see you sweat on your first cruise. Okay. When, when adversity comes up, that's when you want to be the strongest. And you've got to be the strongest to handle it. Well, how do I handle it? With wisdom. With God's Word. That's why He gives you these comparisons. And this is why that you can title these particular chapters, this group of chapters, as um, a personal character. It's your character. How you build it. And you, you sure, when a little adversity comes along, you don't want to fold, friend. That shows a sign of weakness, and you will not only disappoint yourself, you will disappoint your family, you will disappoint all that you do business with, you will be marked as a weak person. Okay. Never, never let them see you sweat, especially when you're one of God's can-do type people. You know God is behind you, you know God has given you power, you know that God has given you counsel in His Word, so why would you sweat? You have no reason to, because God is with you. He's against your enemies. He's against your uh, um, adversary. So why would you worry or why would you fold? Um, that would certainly be a bad, bad sign on your part if you did that. You know, a coward dies a thousand deaths. A brave man dies one time. Okay. Verse 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain. Um, in other words, if you, um, if you um, try to deliver, when, when, one, when you ask, does anybody on a, a man on his way to death give one final call, is there anyone present that can show a reason why we should spare this person's life that would find him innocent? 
Naturally, if you've already proved him to be guilty, end of story. Verse 12. If thou sayest, behold, we, behold, we knew it not. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? Question. And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not the render of every man according, and shall not he render to every man according to his works? I don't know. Who is it that, um, who is it that uh, protects or keepeth the soul? Well, it's our Heavenly Father. You think he doesn't know? You bet he knows. And he com he's considers the heart. And he protects souls. What is the moral to that then? Turn to him. Ask him. Talk to him. Consider with him. Ask his assistance. He knows. You may say you don't know, but I guarantee you he does. So prayerfully ask. Okay. Or um, go to his word. Gain wisdom. But most of all, hear wisdom. To hear as it is written concerning wisdom is to not only hear, but to understand what you're hearing. So what you have here is you may say, I don't know. But if you counsel with Almighty God just a little bit, the keeper of your soul, he that judges your soul, um, uh, he will uh, render to every man according to his works. I don't know, what is your works? What's your character? If your work is for him, you got it made. You don't have anything to worry about, so don't let him see you sweat. Father knows your very heart, your mind, your soul, and um, he takes care of that soul for you uh, when the opposition is too heavy. Verse 13, My son, eat thou honey because it is good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. I mean, upon your palate and upon your taste buds, it just, just even to think about it, your mouth waters. It's so good to you. It's also, I'll add, the food of a prophet, okay, that um, God takes care of his own and God helps his own. So, but wh why would God make a statement like this concerning honey? There's got to be a deeper meaning. Let's find it out. Verse 14. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be into thy soul. Just as that honey is to your taste buds, just as that honey is to the palate of your mouth, wisdom and knowledge is so unto the soul when thou hast found it. Then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. In other words, uh, learning wisdom is food for the soul, divine food, wisdom from God. And when, when you learn to gain wisdom, it does excite the taste buds of the mind as that truth goes over those taste buds of the mind. That divine truth settles in and you come to the realization that our Father gives good advice. You know, that's, that's an excellent analogy he just gave there taking that wonderful nectar from the flower harvested by the insect, the bee, and manufactured right down to where the taste buds just, I mean, they water and yearn when you think about it, when they hit it, when they touch it. Well, so it is wisdom to your mind. What an analogy to appreciate the wisdom of God, His guidance, His understanding. Verse 15, I'm sorry, verse, verse 15, yes. Um, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his nesting place. Um, you, you know, a, a wicked person wants to be real careful how he deals with a righteous person, one that does what's right, because you're dealing with someone that has wisdom. And if you think they're an easy take, you're mistaken. They're going to protect their home. You can lie and wait all you want to, but nine times out of ten, they don't have to call the police to have help. Okay, They can help themselves. They don't fold under pressure. 
they don't fold against an adversary. So a person doesn't want to premeditate. That's what lying in wait means. Uh, a wicked person to go against the dwelling of a righteous person. That's somebody that God guards, watches over, and blesses. Okay. 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. I mean, they're going into calamity, uh, trouble, and suffering. Uh, you know, a, a, a righteous man, this doesn't mean he falls into sin. This means he fall, when trouble comes his way, he can fall seven times. He's going to bounce right back. Seven is spiritual completeness. Well, why seven times spiritual completeness? Because spiritually, he's going to cut it. You know, that's just good exercise. Bring it on, okay, if you, if you ever feel lucky, okay. That's, that's uh, and God takes care of that just man. Um, and, but the wicked, they don't have the, they don't have the uh, protection of Almighty God, and it's open season. Okay. Talk, talk about a loner and talk about calamity. Verse 17, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. That, that, is, that is really hard for someone to grasp if you're not real careful. But there's a reason for that. Why should you not rejoice when your enemy stumbles or falls. Why, why, why wouldn't you want to celebrate? Okay. Well, thank God we're reading the book of Proverbs where you always have a comparison as to what you're supposed to do. Okay. So let's read verse 18 and find out what it is we're supposed to do. Verse 18, lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turned away his wrath from him and quite frankly indicated in the Hebrew, turns it upon you. So when, when you see your enemy fall, why shouldn't you rejoice? Because God is the one that does it and you should be praising God and thanking him for protecting you, not rejoicing over the fate and the fall of somebody else. You should be praising God because he's taking care of business. He's protecting you. And so many times people leave God out of the equation, even when things are good, even when God is doing for you. You don't rejoice over the fall of the enemy. You thank God for having protected you and for causing the enemy to fall. But, um, and, and, but don't forget to praise our Father, to thank Him for taking care of business. I mean, He's got feelings and He has emotions. And um, he expects to be thanked and loved when he accomplishes whatever is needed. And I guarantee you, he's the one that brought 17 to pass, that enemy's fall, the enemy's calamity. God always evens the score. Why? Because vengeance belongeth to God. And I'm talking here not about things you can handle. I'm talking about things you can't handle, but he sure can. Okay. Don't you ever sell God short and don't you ever doubt him. So instead of rejoicing that the enemy's going down and suffering, praise God for taking care of business, for protecting you, your family, and uh, your being. Verse 19. Fret not thyself because of evil men. Neither be thou envious at the wicked. Um, don't, um, uh, most of all, don't keep company with them. Don't run with them. And don't fret about it. Okay? You, you don't, uh, point, because you just had the answer. God takes care of business. That that you can't even. He can even change minds. Verse 20. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. Now, that is the opposite of referring back to verse 14, where it says, and the expectation shall not be cut off. God is not going to cut off a righteous person, but the wicked, he's going to put them out. He's going to snuff them out. They're gone, over, done with. 
That's your comparison back with verse 14 to this verse. Verse uh, 14, for the good, that knowledge and wisdom, the very taste of honey to the buds of your mind, the very knowledge and wisdom of God taking care of his own is food for your soul and will keep you from being cut off. Whereas uh, those that like to think evil and deal with evil, you don't have to fret about it. Well, it just, you know, you'll hear people say, it just worries me about the wicked. You don't have to worry about them. Don't rejoice over them and don't worry over them. Take care of business and that's that you can't handle. Don't worry, God can, okay? So uh, there you have the uh, equation from 20 to 14, okay? Verse 21, my son, fear thou the Lord and the king and meddle not with them that are given to change. This means don't mingle with those that are given to change. This is people that always teach. There's going to be a change. And you've got some people so stupid that they don't even ask, well, what's the change to? What are we change? What's What kind of change are you talking? I just won't change in a way. I mean, you know, and just go on. Change to what? Have, you know, get a, don't be so dumb. Don't be stupid. Always know what you're changing to. Your children depend on it. Your life depends on it. Your country depends on it. It so happens that this word in the Hebrew is changers to that that is ir irregular and renegades, okay, that destroy, that lead to trouble and nothingness, hot air, cheap words. Change, change, change. Don't mess with changers. That's wisdom. That is God's advice, okay? Um, back to the beginning of this chapter where it says, don't make war unless you know what you're doing. You sure want to watch a changer, my friend. 22, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? You don't want to go down with them, and you don't want your ship to go down with them because their ruin is coming. Verse 23, these things, th these words, also belong to the wise. It is good to have respect to persons in judgment. Th that's just automatic. If they're right and if they're justice, if they're just, okay, um, that is wisdom. 24, he that saith unto the wicked, thou art righteous, him shall the people curse and nation shall abhor him. Why? Because he's lying. Okay. He, gave, he vouched for a person that has no character. His personal conduct is awful. And you're a false witness. God does not like false witnesses. God goes a long ways out of his way to take care of false witnesses. Verse 25. But to them that rebuke him shall he delight, shall be delight, and a good blessing shall come upon them. Uh, and, and so it is. You that rebuke somebody that is a liar, a false witness, uh, God will bless you for it. Okay. 26, every man shall kiss his lips that giveth a right answer. This means that right words are as welcome as a good friend. Okay, meaning a holy kiss, okay, is a, 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 of the old Eastern um, a custom that, um, uh, it, that uh, lips that speak the truth or like meeting an old friend when you love wisdom. 27, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thine house. Uh, this is this is very good advice, and in the old days, it was said of people that migrated to this nation, build the barn first, build a good barn, and then build the house, okay? In other words, get that income, get your business in line, and then build a nice house. But um, if you build a nice house and let your business in the field go to waste, uh, you may not need that house very long, okay? If we were to upgrade that to this day and time, take care of your profession. Get solid in where 
you are best fitted and suited in your profession, whatever it may be, and then locate you a house, but not until. Okay. Verse 28. Be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause, and deceive not with thy lips. This doesn't mean as much bearing false witness as it does. Don't give too much unnecessary information on your neighbor that is nothing but pure gossip. Okay. There, there are some things in the neighborhood, if you have a good neighbor, you want to protect them. If you're going to be a good neighbor... Certain people, when, when, when you have your home, you want privacy. Well, your neighbor cannot help at times noting that that is private to you. And if he goes and gossips about it, he's not a good neighbor. So I'll read that again so that you understand. Be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause. Now, if there's a cause, that's a different story, okay? And not to be a, uh, to, to, uh, in a witness in the positive sense that it's true and correct and should be. And deceive not with thy lips. I mean, don't, don't unnecessarily bring a bunch of gossip into a community that causes hurt and trouble. 29. Say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work, according to his conduct. Um, uh, don't say that. And of course, this looks forward to the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And um, many people like to say, do your brother before he does you. That's not what it means. Don't do that. Okay. Well, why, why would you not do that? Well, God just told you in this same chapter, uh, back in verse uh, 21, 18, 19, he'll take care of business. That that you can't handle you don't have to fret about it. He'll handle it. Trust him. Okay. Just as you trust good taste and sweet honey to the buds of your mind, his wisdom lets you know he's not going to let you fall. But in verse 21, we found out that uh, he, um, verse 20 rather, that he will let the wicked fall because the, he doesn't do it. They do it to themselves. Okay. So uh, good conduct and you have a good neighbor, good conduct, and you have a good Christian. Verse 30, I went by the field of the slothful. That's a lazy person, went by his field, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. I, I walked by there and I looked. Well, what would you see? A slothful is a lazy person, okay? When you look at his property and when you look at his place and when you look at his vineyard, vineyard, 31, and lo, it was all growing over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. The, I want you to apply this also to the condition of the soul. Because when you don't pay attention to God's word, you can be kind of like that slothful person that your spiritual body, your soul, your personal character, that's the subject, can be broken down and growing over with thorns and nettles till you, you, you lose contact with Almighty God to know that He wants to love you, He wants to protect you, He wants to take care of business. And just as if, I mean, he doesn't have to worry about this being a proper analogy because if it's a lazy person, you can look at their house and tell. Their property. You can always tell. Naturally, you don't judge. There's always extenuating circumstances. He may be ill for that time, but I mean that his habitual, okay, an habitual lazy person, uh, their property shows it. Their car shows it. Their very being shows it. Okay. But don't be well dressed, well groomed. Your property looks like. I mean, shining right like the sun, morning, the sun in the morning, but let your soul be rotten, okay? Run down, holds in your spiritual fence where you really don't know come here from Sikkim as far as the emotions and the feeling of Almighty God. When he goes to this trouble, giving us these comparisons of good and evil, 
of which way you should choose. Certainly make the choice and, and make sure that your, the condition of your soul is not like that lazy person's fence. Okay. You don't want that. Don't want it at all. Next verse, 32. Then I, then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Man, you should. Okay. What kind of instructions? 33. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. 34. To finish the chapter. So shall thy poverty, your need, come as one that travaileth. And, the, and thy want as an armed man. That's to say a, a man with a shield. It's, um, and when you have the, lack of what? Lack of armor. Lack of the gospel armor. Your soul having deteriorated. Well, I'll get around to it tomorrow. Just a little more sleep and a few more times. I'm quite busy. I don't have time to consider God's word. Just tomorrow or the next day, the next year, and time goes on and the soul deteriorates and falls apart. Okay. God's blessings leave the family. Holds in the fence. No army whatsoever. And poverty and need come upon that person. Why? They don't have God's blessings. You don't want to forget this lesson. In verse 14, God promised you won't fall. If you do it my way, you will not fall. Even if you go down seven times, you're going to bounce right back and you're going to overcome. But as, uh, as verse 20 said, you be wicked and you're going down. Hey, you know, the choice is yours. You think about it, all right? Don't miss the next lecture. It's good for the soul. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time. This is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit Move, got a question? You share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or organization or denomination. Let's don't judge people. God's judge. All you have to do is sip that honey and let the buds of your mind absorb the wisdom from God's Word. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Do you know that? He knows what you're thinking right now. You don't even have to say it out loud. You're his child, and he loves you. He may not love what you're doing, but he does love you. Talk to him and let him return that love and be blessed. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, question time. Lucy from Canada. Um, I... Um, and I'm glad you enjoy the program. I love the path for those. So if, if this is so, then I guess for those 1,000 years, the millennium, there will still be um, the presence of sin and evil. Uh, well, remember that Satan is locked in the pit, though. So not sin and evil influences you might think today. It comes down to the fact with Satan 
as chapter 20 of the great book of Revelations, verses 1 and 2 stipulate, that he is bound in the pit, body, soul, and spirit. Now his spirit can wander the earth and influence people. But during the millennium, it cannot. Therefore, the evil that you will see, and it will be there, is from the person, the, the person his or herself meaning they're just bad, and that's what God wants to know, okay? I thought when we return to the earth with Jesus, it will be the kingdom come, the only place good for, well, that's after the millennium, okay? After the millennium. Death does not go into the pit until the, it's called the second death. And what it is, it's the death of the soul of those that wish to join Satan in that pit, okay? Um, Kiri from Kara from Louisiana, 10 years old. Well, it's good to have you with us, hon. When the um, Antichrist comes, will people know that he is not the real Christ? Because some people are going to think that um, it's him, the true Christ. My pastor told me to watch you, and she said that you are a good teacher. So that's why I'm watching you. Well, fantastic, and God bless your pastor. Glad for that, hon. But it is true that many people, as a matter of fact, it states in the third chapter of the great book of Revelation that all the world, other than God's elect, will wonder after him, thinking it is the true Christ, all right? You're not gonna be deceived. It's obvious you're in good shape. I'm happy for you. Natalie from California. When Satan gets kicked out of heaven and angels and his angels with him, how do we cast out demons and evil spirits when Satan is um, here on earth? Do we say what uh, Michael's archangel said, uh, get behind me? No, you, 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 you go by what God's word says. He does not leave us unprotected. That's what the 13th chapter of Mark is all about is you do it exactly that way. When you're delivered up, you don't premeditate what you're gonna say. You don't say anything. There's a special reason you don't say anything because the Holy Spirit is gonna speak through you. And I assure you what, they, what the Holy Spirit has to say through you is a lot more important than what you might think you wanna say. You will allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide at that time. That's what it's all about. Matthew 24, Mark 13 tells you exactly what to do. Diana from Connecticut. How will America be in the end times? Is it in the Bible? Well, of course, the, the God would not leave out of the word of God the superpower of superpower in these end times. Naturally, he didn't. And he tells about the migrations of the house of Israel. The migration over the Caucasus Mountains called Caucasian settled Europe and then later migrated to Canada and America. And we have that house made up of many people, blessed of God. Why? Because we love God. We worship God. And God blesses uh, all people that, um, that follow him, love him, and praise him. And certainly... Wherever that is written, you can see that. Uh, and quite frankly, I feel that Isaiah chapter 18 describes America and uh, in prophecy. The nation divided by big rivers like the Mississippi and um, the Colorado and, and many others. And, and blessed with the people that love God. There's a lot that don't, but that's okay. There's more of us that do. Margarita from, Margarita from Tennessee. Who was Lot's wife? She was the father, she was the mother of Lot's children. Okay, that's, she, they, she had a nickname, her name was Salty. Okay, and um, that's what they called her. I, I jest in a sense, it isn't written, but she was turned to a pillar of salt because it was right there at the Salt Sea and it kind of, gathered up on her. Lori from Nevada. Um, you're welcome. I like, enjoy answering questions. Lori from Nevada says, I have left a trail of Shepherd's Chapel's uh, Easter and 
Christmas CDs behind me in public places, restaurants, waiting rooms, and so forth. Is this seed planting or can it be casting pearls before swine or overloading someone's donkey? My hope is our Father would lead someone to pick one up and change their life. Well, if it's just one, and don't worry, you know, most people, if it's going to overload them, they wouldn't pay attention to it anyway. But there is always that one that will grab on. Is it aiding Satan by patronizing Christian bookstores as they also sell plenty of rapture and other misleading books and items? Well, no, it, it's, um, you know, we, we're not in a perfect world by any means. And never let a little bit of what is wrong discourage you in doing what is right. Bill from California, I hope and pray that you will ha that you will or have been or are planning to write a Bible commentary, King James Version, with your explanation of the books, chapters, and verses as you do in your Bible study classes on television. You are such a blessing to those who want to learn, live by, and love God's Word. God surely has blessed you with an ability to convey His Word, and you would be doing such a great service to those looking for the truth. Uh, well, you know, um, uh, Bill, I'm, we, who knows, we may get around to that. So far, we, uh, this um, teaching ministry in this way, utilizing the modern technologies that we have, works out real well, but hey, who knows? Um, John from Indiana, my question is, is it wrong that I love God more than myself? No, that's a good sign. You should love God more than yourself. I mean, after all, He died for you. Okay? Is it wrong that I should believe in God without going to church? Don't, give me, don't get me wrong. I like to read the Bible and watch your program. Well, well you know, you have to do what God leads you. I, I really, truly believe that Christians are led by God. And they, if, if there is not a Bible teaching church near you, you're in church when you're studying with us. We are a church. And this is an extension of our church, and it is a church by air. So you're in church. Don't think you're not. Where God's Word is taught, that's what a church is. A building that uh, maybe only covers one verse and then just talks hot air for an hour, that's not a church. That's not a Bible teaching church. You need to go where God's Word is taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you gain wisdom and knowledge from Almighty God. And that's, um, so your church, no problem. Mike from Colorado. Uh, my cousin recently moved back to Colorado from California after being gone for about 30 years and belongs to another faith. For nine years I have had not had the opportunity to discuss our Father's wonderful word with anyone without being laughed at or scorned. Uh, when we opened the Bible and started reading about the three earth ages and Satan being the father of Cain, her mind opened a little, but she refuses to accept that Christ is God. Please help me with scripture for witness. Well, what he was named, Emmanuel, God with us. And, and uh, St. John chapter 14, Jesus would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because he was made in the image of Almighty God, uh, looking just like him. And that's why God said, call him Emmanuel, God with us, because he was. Okay. There are dimensions, and perhaps you could break into that just a little bit. Our Father is in another dimension. So the Word had to become flesh as it's written in the first chapter of John and walked with us. He is that Word. Read the first verse of the St. Saint, Saint John. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Uh, Larry from Texas. Where in the Bible does it say we will know our loved ones in heaven? Most asked question. Ezekiel chapter 44 has to do with the millennium. In other words, the millennium begins in chapter 40. In chapter 44, it stipulates that God's elect, the Zadok, can go to a loved one and names off uh, close family relations. Naturally, you would have to recognize them and know them or you could not help them. So 
naturally, we will know them. And this is really quite simple because we're, we are made in the image we were, we're in that image now, and we will be again. Uh, there's no such thing as age, and you have to take that into consideration. James from Texas. How will the sellers know not to sell to the people who don't have the mark of the beast? Well, there's only one way that you can get the, there will be a change of money. And it will be a one world money. And the only way you could acquire that money would be to worship him. We're not going to. We can't. So therefore, they won't have to worry about selling to us. This is why it's important to be wiser than the serpent and, and learn how to barter a little bit. That means trade with what you've got for something um, that uh, somebody would like to have. Okay. And then you don't have to go there to buy or sell. You can barter with neighbors, friends uh, that uh, don't know any better. Barbie from Colorado. Do we have the same families in the first earth age as we do now? Well, nobody could answer that for sure, but it's very likely that uh, uh, so. I think uh, God's, it, we could just simply say God stated to the elect, I chose you before the foundations of this earth. So certainly they work together and and so it doesn't mean necessarily they were of the same family, but they knew each other. Teresa from Mississippi. How do you feel about women wearing pants in church? Well, it's perfectly all right if it's, it's, if it's a woman's apparel. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5, most people are ignorant concerning God's word. And this is why they say, a woman must not wear the clothing of man. And that's... that's that, that's not what the uh, scripture means. It means that a woman shall not take the part of a man in a sexual act, nor will a man take the part of a woman in a sexual act. Okay, that, that's, that's all it means. Quite frankly, when Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 5 was written, men wore skirts. Okay, So what, what are they going to say about that? Because... <clears throat> that would mean women couldn't wear skirts. But see, that's not the true meaning of, of the scripture at all. And, uh, and so it is. Uh, Romans chapter 1 backs that up, okay, documents it. So, uh, uh, you know, a woman's pantsuit is not men's clothing. Uh, I'd like to see one of these um, pastors if they think that a woman's got on man's clothing and it's a woman's pantsuit, I'd like to see him in it, okay? Uh, that'd be a sight to behold, you know? They just don't know what they're talking about, unfortunately. Um, and anything that is decent, moderate, and that's good. Michelle from Oklahoma, does it talk about the rapture in the Bible so Christians won't have to go through the tribulation? The word rapture is not in the Bible. As a matter of fact, God states in Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 20 through 25, that he's against people teaching their, his children to fly to save their souls. He doesn't like that. He wants you to put the gospel armor on and in place and stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Don't wilt before your enemy. What is the tribulation? The three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went into the fiery furnace. Christ walked with them. They weren't even singed, nor was their clothing singed. That's what we are in the tribulation. It will not harm us. And um, as far as Satan's tribulation, which is what you want to worry about, that's when we're delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaks through us. That's the purpose and destiny of Christians. Instead of dreaming about flying away like a big bird, you put on the gospel armor, there is not one word in it about a jet pack or wings, okay? We, we, we stand and we fight. We fight Satan and those that come with him when he's cast out of heaven to this earth. And we do just exactly as Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 instruct. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Marvin from Ohio, what is the best material for a beginner to start with? Well, I, Marvin, I like, we have a, a tape that we offer for free, a Mark of the Beast tape, to give an overall working knowledge of uh, God's plan. 
and I, I'd like for you to have that. And then, and then after that, um, pick whatever your fancy is after having listened to that Mark of the Beast tape. Usually the chapter I just mentioned, the book of Mark or the book of Revelation, something that has to do with this generation. Because everybody wants to know, what's in this for me? Where am I? Where, what time are we at? It'll tell you. Jesse from South Carolina. If the pastor doesn't believe in the rapture, I would like to know why and what scripture do you base that on? Well, if the word rapture is not in the Bible, why would you want to teach it? I'm not going to teach something that's not written in God's word. Most people teach the rapture, I will answer in this way, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, but they overlook verse 13 where Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant like the heathen about our gathering back to Christ, that if you believe Christ rose from the dead and you better, or you're not a Christian, then you better believe all that have died or asleep, they're with him. They have already resurrected. They're with him in paradise. And at the last trump, then Christ returns and we're all changed into a spiritual body here on earth. We have work to do here. And that's where he says it's going to be, okay? Don and Christy from Ohio. We've been with you since December of 96 and wanted to tell you that we love you and God bless you and we pray for Pastor Murray's good health and the boys and their families for many, many years to come. Well, God bless you. Appreciate that. We're going to stick around and fight the good fight as long as it's possible. Joanne from California. In Revelation, what are the... What are the beasts coming up out of the earth to kill a third of mankind? I, I think you're thinking about Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, where the beast comes up out of the earth, but he's, what does he look like? It's important that you catch that. He looks like the lamb slain, got two horns like the lamb. He looks like Jesus Christ, in other words. But he has the voice of the dragon, meaning it's the Antichrist, it's the devil. And he's going to deceive by deception. A lot of people are going to, that have not been taught that because Satan's message is, I'm going to rapture you out of here. We're leaving. Only gather your kin folks that don't believe in me and let's convert them so we can take them with you. And they will. They will turn you in. Your own mother would turn you in if she was a non-believer. That's scripture, Mark chapter 13. Mother would turn on daughter and father the son and vice versa. Zach from New Mexico, seven years old. What will father do to destroy Satan? I love you, Pastor Murray. You're the coolest guy. Well, thank you, uh, Zach. Um, father, it is written in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, how God's going to destroy Satan. He's the king of Tyre. That's a fake rock. That's what Tyrus means in the Hebrew tongue. But you can read what happens to him in Revelation chapter 20 in the last three verses. And you will note that he goes into the lake of fire. That's what happens to him. God does a good job of it. Brenda from Kentucky. From the beginning of Gentiles, why couldn't they receive salvation and after that did receive salvation? How does that affect the Gentiles today? Uh, just as it would anyone else. Christ went back uh, while he was yet in the tomb, all the way to the people back to the time of Noah, and gave them the opportunity to receive salvation, to receive and accept him. And um, so the, the fact that Israel was chosen was why? It's a key to David. It's through that genealogy that Christ himself would come. And without him, there would be no salvation, basically. So the whole thing led up to that, and he had to pay that price on the cross before that type of salvation was available for Gentiles or anyone. And then that opened up salvation because he died for all of us, that if whomsoever would believe should not perish, but would have eternal life. Um, Alfred from Mississippi, I wanted to ask about joining your church and tithing. I've come into some money recently, and I don't know what to do about my tithes. Well, we, I, 
you have to talk to the Lord Jesus Christ to join this church, okay? And I'll tell you what, if he approves you, if he approves you, you're in, okay? But he's the head of this church, the Lord Jesus Christ is, and whatever he says to you, if he accepts you, you're a member. You always pay your tithes where you're taught. And if, you, if, if your local church teaches you better than we teach you, you should tithe there, okay? If we teach you better than the local church, then you should tithe accordingly. That, that's up to you. You have to use your own judgment. David from Georgia. Please explain James chapter 1, verse 5. What does upbraided mean? It means to defame, to rile, to chide, or uh, to taunt. You don't do that to people. Okay? You don't want to chide people. Uh, a, a Christian mouth should be a mouth of encouragement, not chiding. Okay? Uh, Nisi from Mississippi. I lost my son, and he was my best friend, and I need to know how to exist and go on in this world without him. Well, you're going to be back together with him. It may not be all that long, okay? But all, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 is always a good scripture. But I, I would like for you to order from us where are the dead and know just exactly where your son is, and that'll help you a bunch. He's with the Father and doing real good, okay? So... Uh, so be it. Now, listen to me. We're out of time again. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. You make God's day, He's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, most of all, though, uh, when you bless God, He blesses you. But this is what's most important indeed, that you stay in His Word every day in His Word according to your appetite. It's a good day even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.